the official unveiling of the Fortune India SPJ Institute of Management and Research white paper on enhancing women leadership in India Inc. And thank you very much Dr. Preeta George for joining us this evening and with that let this riveting conversation begin. Uh, thank you honorable minister and thank you for uh, this opportunity. Uh, it was uh, uh, supported uh, wholeheartedly by uh, your ministry ma'am and uh, and CII and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation who uh, you had requested and uh, they joined us. Uh, one of the first few things that I would like to, the, the most uh, striking things that uh, I'd like to uh, start with is about the representation of women on, uh, uh, on Fortune 1000 companies, the origin of this discussion. Uh, only about 3.2% of Fortune 1000 companies have women at the helm as MDs and CEOs. Uh, what would you say in your first thoughts uh, to India Inc., we have some of the best leaders around here, uh, to do to ensure that uh, leadership, in, in leadership roles uh, are, uh, are assigned or at least, uh, uh, you know, given the responsibility of for uh, for women leaders uh, wherever possible. So, Mr. Dubey, you'd like me to speak to a room where you need to first ascertain whether the people in the room are the ones that anoint leaders. Uh -huh. So, are you speaking to a room of recipients or are you speaking to a room of anointers? And I think that is where Absolutely. conversations mostly fail. Because you would like us to apply ourselves in terms of dialogue to people who are not the decision makers, but who are at the receiving end of the challenge that is ascribed in this white paper. I believe what is alarming is that the white paper reflects on the realities of women and their positions in corporate India, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the perspective of how they are positioned in Fortune 500 companies. There has been for too long a presumption that SMEs, or for that matter, mid-level companies don't know better. And that is why women don't have an enhanced opportunity with regards to career advancements in such companies. The other presumption is that most Fortune 500 companies know better because they are not only erudite, they've had global experiences, and they know that there is a legislative framework so that career advancement is equally distributed irrespective of gender within the company. What is alarming about this white paper is that there is an acceptance that the ladder is broken. And the reasons for the ladder being broken are three as per this report. One, when a woman gets married. Second, when the woman has a child. And alarmingly, third, when the woman's child sits for board exams. The fact that this is a report, a reflection on Fortune 500 companies, tells you that the challenge at the bottom of the pyramid is far greater. What has come out of this dialogue and this white paper is also, and we've had this discussion in the national capital, Women know that companies now have a legislative framework of giving 26 weeks of maternity leave. But they are scared to use it because they look upon it as an opportunity for the company to offload them. So we are today at a precipice of a very, very dichotomous position where the government is providing a framework which the industry has been mulling over for years on end. And it's the industry which is not stepping up. So while you'd like me to tell this room what to do, the question is, it's the people missing from this room who need to get things done. Because whoever's in the room is already committed. Yes. One of the, one of the suggestions, ma'am, that came out of the, of the white paper was about recognition, as in, uh, recognition for corporates who are doing enough uh, in this space. You want uh, recognition for people to do the right thing. Uh, 
you want us to uh, hold them in high esteem because they are doing what they ought to be doing. And that's where the problem is. That you expect women to celebrate that one odd corporate leader who is just. Which means the other side of the prism is that most are so unjust that we should be grateful at least one or two of them are just. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, I… I'm sorry, I'm putting a man in a spot, but that's what <laughs> normally women do. So, I, I must say that the, uh, the suggestions have all come largely from women. So, I must say that, you know, oh, I'm, so I'm only holding that, a flag So, if for women are say, so imagine this, <clears throat> that women who have been engaged with for your white paper, who are a part of Fortune 500 companies, who are achievers in their own right, are telling you, hell with it, let's at least acknowledge those who have done us right. Can you imagine the state of affairs? Like I said, the presumption was that this kind of discrimination would be manifested in ecosystems where people are not well read, don't have exposure. Countries uh, such as Sweden, ma'am, um, call their maternity benefits policies as What's paternal. the population of Sweden? <laughs> what, what? It's a very small country. Yeah, I know. But, you know, some of these, uh, some of these policies, uh, you know, one looks at or looks up to in terms of, uh, uh, you know, their Most progressiveness of us want to from the from the Western, uh, you know, uh, Europe. That's what I'm saying. Most yeah. of us want to uh, do an apples and oranges kind of a comparative. Yeah. Which is, look at what New Zealand is doing. Look at what Sweden is doing. Look at our population. We are a country with 125 constitutionally recognized languages, 16,000 dialects, 1.4 billion people, of which 940 million will go to vote in the next 60 days. So our opportunities, our capacities, our national resources are differentiated. The issue is, when you look at the gender aspect, uh, you want to do apples and oranges and tell us that what is good for Sweden is good for India, which is not the case. Today, if you look at the national output with regards to STEM, 43% of STEM graduates in India are women. That number is not comparable to any other European nation. If you look at the number of women who are doing PhDs today in our country, in the past nine years, that number has gone up by 99%. We have 263 million children in our K-12 systems right now. 50% of them are young girls. 43 million in the higher education systems. Again, 50% of them young ladies. The issue is, how much are we providing for their transition from a higher educational institution, let's say, to enterprise? So if you look at the entrepreneurial methodology right now, most VCs are happy to fund startups which are owned and operated by men as compared to women. So they would rather invest in men failing than women succeeding. Another suggestion. Ms. Piramel has a lot of sympathies for you. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can lip read. So. <laughs> And Mr. Dube is becoming red in the face. Oh, uh, yeah. Yep. One of the suggestions, another, but, but I must say again that, you know, the, um, uh, some of these uh, have actually resonated very well with the, uh, with the uh, uh, you know, leader, leadership. Who? Both at, uh, uh, both at uh, senior leadership and also one of, the, one of the most important things that we heard from... Uh, 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 emerging women leaders in particular from this in this report was that they were saying no to work from home you know they were they were they were saying that they want to be in the in the thick of things they want yes to be, because uh, if they work from home you will leave them behind work from home was always a female concept till the pandemic came and then men had to work from home so it became acceptable Greater levels of reporting um, that can be uh, required of companies 
on on diversity what do you report on something that doesn't exist so forcing and requiring them to uh, report on the my, issue is, in, Mr. on Dubai, more the on issue more is do you details. want the government to police corporate india you don't no. yeah you <clears> want <throat> this to be a conscientious uh, effort by industry the question is that i ask as a female professional is what is lacking in the female potential in corporate india that they do not get that equal opportunity are we not good at our jobs in fact we work beyond the shifts that have been ascribed to us beyond the standard outcomes that are expected of us why because we want to retain our jobs we want to be competitive when we have opportunities and i'm talking as a female professional and not as a as a minister when a woman gets an opportunity for career advancement they negotiate weaker contracts only so that they can have better titles at the door that is the reality so the question is the problem in this white paper is it does not quantify what women are lacking that they will not be ascribed that equal opportunity to compete so i think that the white paper is the first big step in recognizing that the problem is not a problem of mid level companies or smes the problem is that the top of the pyramid is equally unjust until yeah. such time we keep looking only at the bottom of the pyramid and think that the top is sorted out we i think will keep doing great injustice to women i mean i always tell people that no matter what your age your gender is always a problem when you're in your 20s you're too young to succeed when you're in your 30s you're too married to succeed in advance when you're in your 40s the 20 year olds are knocking at the door to know that you should soon retire and make way for the young ones when you're in your 50s you're done when you're in your 60s you're professionally dead so there is no age group when it's good to be a woman <laughs> so we will um, we will uh, with This your permission this is a room that is already committed yes So you don't need to ask them questions. No, I'm saying with and with your permission, we will be uh, requesting some questions from the audience for you. Yeah. Uh, if you for me, uh, I think they will ask you. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if I may, um, you know, uh, shift focus to the World Economic Forum. Yes. Twenty twenty four. You spoke about the importance of normalizing conversations among among uh, women's wellness to close the gender health gap. Uh, gender health gap. could you would you like to elaborate a bit on such conversations how they have evolved but i never made that statement so what is the statement the he spoke about the importance of normalizing conversations around women's wellness to close the gender health gap no i never made that specific statement and knowing me i remember everything i say but uh, i think what i spoke about is the need to normalize um a conversation around the economic need to attend to women's health okay and i spoke about it from the perspective of how in family units or in our communities most women self medicate because either they don't have the time or they don't have the economic energy to prioritize their own health and one of the cases that comes from let's say ayushman bharat If you look at the numbers from October 2023 Aishwan Bharat had 5.7 crore hospital admissions that were worth 70000 crores of which 48% were female patients Now if you look at that health framework which has been provided for by the government for the first time 20 crore women have gotten themselves screened for cancer of the breast and the cervix which means women always knew what the challenge was and where the solution lay all they wanted was an economic instrument and medical infrastructure where to go to to get that help so that is why i think i spoke in the context of the global health alliance that the world economic forum had pronounced yeah. that more and more we need to normalize conversations about putting a female's health need first 
and not push her towards only self-medication for the lack, like I said, of either time or economic energy. We have um, uh, some questions. I think mics uh, are being distributed. So if there, is, if there are any questions from the audience for the minister, please, uh, please do raise your hand. If you can, if you can introduce yourself and then yes. ask the question to the minister. The gentleman right at the last. Yes. Yeah, uh, hi, I'm Prashant Fernandez and I'm a banker. And uh, my question is that uh, I think corporates have made a lot of strides uh, in equalizing uh, opportunities for women and they've come a long way. So the question I'm trying to ask is, uh, would you recommend that women be uh, more assertive at home? Um, because where I come from, like just uh, some time back, a panelist said that uh, there are very highly qualified women drawing big salaries, but it goes into an account which is handled by their father-in-law or uh, by their husband, so they do not have access to their own money. Or even now we see that sometimes a husband's career takes precedence over everything else, even if he's not a very good... May I know your name, sir? Uh, Prashant Fernandez. Prashant, women know how to read a room and a family. So many a times they buy through their silence, peace. Women know. And I think that though you think that corporate India has taken great strides, the numbers tell a different story. So yes, in terms of the pipeline, in terms of the labor force, at the entry level, yes, you will find that the numbers are surging. And that's not because they are women only, that's because they are more productive for the organizations that hire them. But it's positions which entail power and money. That is where the advancement is a bit stagnated. The numbers are abysmal. So entry level, yes. You will find women everywhere in great numbers. In fact, in some companies, greater numbers of the shop floor as compared to men. Why? Because they don't stagnate in terms of their input, no matter what happens in their life cycle. But insofar as women being more assertive at home, women know how to read relationships. So if it means taking your money, putting it into a joint account, and then allowing somebody else to lead an economic decision, I can say this as a working mother, women know that they are allowing that space for dominance by somebody else. And whenever they have an opportunity, they utilize their own financial instruments to take independent decisions. Point in case, four crore homes were built by Prime Minister Modi with only one legislative direction, that all homes have to be prioritized in terms of ownership vis-a-vis -vis women. Today, 2.5 crore homes are now owned by women. And of the 1.5 crore homes, that don't have the first name of the woman, they are jointly owned by the woman. So the Prime Minister created a legislative framework. Women grabbed it. Prime Minister says, let's give collateral free support of one crore to female entrepreneurs. 40,000 crores were spent in Stand Up India. 80% of the beneficiaries turned out to be women. Look at another layer of economic engagement. 31 crore mudra loans given to women. 8 crore loans to first-time entrepreneurs. NPA less than 2.5%. These are women who were waiting for an opportunity, but did not assert themselves in their family systems. So that is why I think that while the government has walked the talk, it is time for communities and leadership. And I think Mr. Dubey was very, very, um, in some way, courageous to do this white paper in collaboration with the ministry because it takes a very, very tough heart to hold a mirror to your own ecosystem, which is what this white paper has done. Fortune is supposed to celebrate only achievement. For the first time, Fortune has stuck its neck out and called out what is wrong, which is one of the first steps towards the change that we all seek. Yes. We have a question. 
Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Deepika Sumaya. I am uh, working in a corporate company and uh, at a, a senior level management. I have two questions. One, with this white paper coming in place, and we got to know the uh, real face of the management that happens, what steps are we taking as a government uh, to bring out the corporate females of a second level or a third level to be brought up? And such white papers do not uh, show such results. Second question is in respect to the uh, many steps that have been taken by the government for the empowerment of a female financially and to grow economically. Uh, there is a part which you also said, ma'am, that females do sacrifice and they do not speak up for themselves. And that is also equivalent for an educated female. What steps do you think should the females take up to come out of the old traditions and speak up for themselves? Firstly, I don't think justice and traditions are at loggerheads. That is one of the biggest anomalies we have in conversations. Secondly, I believe that when you're talking about white papers such as this, prefunctionally, why I said that this is a courageous step taken by Fortune? Because they've been part of boardrooms reporting on all the glory. The fact that they also become a part of the reportage with regards to the challenge and how the ladder is broken in corporate India is the kind of conversation you need publications like them to have. Just imagine there is a differentiated award for female CEO achievers. It's not about top 100 CEOs, it's about top 100 female CEOs. And why does Fortune have to do that? Because of two, three main issues that even today those who are hiring for those high level positions, they are thinking from a very skewed perspective. So this white paper cannot be wished away because who would imagine that Fortune 500 companies deny opportunities all because a mid-level female corporate player has a child who has to sit for board exams. It's unimaginable. So we in the government have also parallelly, since 2017, 6 crore, 43,000 uh, new, uh, 43 lakh new EPFO subscribers have come into the system. We ran a whole analysis with over 3 lakh 36,000 such employees for 15 days, asking them to report whether they have an internal complaints committee, which as mandated by law is currently functional in their companies. So in government now we know who does not have such a functional unit. So we can reach out through the labor commissioner to say, if it has a company size which has more than 20 people, you need to have the ICC which is functional. So that is what we can do as government. But the issue is, do you want the government to police corporate India? You don't. True. So the government, like I said, is walking the talk. It's time for corporate India to step up. And the first step to stepping up is to recognize there is a challenge. Because for far too long, if you have conversations like this, imagine every time we spoke about the female construction labor, we never brought into account that most construction companies are owned by corporates. So if they wanted to have a semblance of gender justice, even in construction sites, they could very well afford it. But till such time, you don't hold out such conversations. How will you compel change? So just one small addition to it, like ECG and all other important disclosures are a part of an annual report. Can there not be a mandatory provision of to understand and make it disclose of how many female uh, leaders have developed or emerged out of the organization? So that it gives a clear and transparent uh, showcase of how much yes, grooming has happened? Yes, but the issue, madam, is this. I went to Amethi as a BJP candidate, not because I was a woman. I went because I was the best damn candidate to make Rahul Gandhi lose. <laughs> so how many of us need to turn up for competitive positions because of our gender and how many of us want to be in that position because of our skill set? Thank you. Ma'am, with your permission, we can take one last question before we move to the awards. 
Yes, ma'am. Ma I'm Sharmishtha Rai Chaudhary. I am an HR at a senior level. Uh, the question, what the other ma'am told is quite similar. Uh, women definitely bargain low at a level. That is because in order to sustain her position, uh, whether at, uh, you know, retain the organization, retain herself in the organization or retain a position, whether she is single or she is managing a family. Ma'am, my question is why there can't be certain policy which can help women to have certain percentage uh, in the workforce. I don't want the government to police, but at the same time, there has to be certain rule where the decision maker is bound uh, to have such uh, numbers in the female leader, especially in the boardroom. Like I said, the law already exists, especially if you look at the new labor code. The issue is the law exists with regards to maternity leave, with regards to crashes at the workplace, with regards to internal complaints committee, with regards to how many females should be there in the boardroom, with regards to not discriminating, equal pay for equal work. The law exists. The issue is companies say that we can self-regulate and ensure that the law is followed to the last letter. So the law exists. And now it is incumbent upon corporate leadership in consonance with the law and government agencies to ensure that it's implemented. That's true. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, I, I, there are a lot of people wanting to talk to you, but I'm, I'm afraid we're running out of time. Um, ma'am, thank you very much for taking these questions.